Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, Thursday meetings. All right, so we're going to start by, like the professor said, uh, going back a little bit. I assume that you guys have all seen the Ethologist Reacts program that we did with, of course, Michael and Professor Abrantes and our special guest, Arun Arnes. So one of the videos that we covered in the program was that infamous video from the wolf park with the pack of wolves and the soldiers and then the uh, conflict with the zookeeper there. Anna, go ahead and ask your question to Professor Abrantes and Michael. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Didn't the group join in when a demon was attacked, attacked uh, by the, um, the zookeeper? I know that um, demon didn't do anything because of the benefit and cost, but all the other group uh, didn't join in for any particular reason, or they were only watching. Um, is there a relationship with the zookeeper? Do they see her as a mate and not uh, alien? Um, and I wanted to, to know if it's a normal behavior of the wolves uh, to, don't, uh, to not interfere in this kind of interaction. The zookeeper is not uh, a, a mate. Uh, is more like a, an, an alien. Uh, it's an alien that they know. It's not an unknown alien, but it's an alien. I define it in my book, The Evolution of Canine Social Behavior, and in many other articles. Mates are individuals uh, whose survival depend on one another, and aliens are individuals whose survival do not depend on one another. They, they treat her like an alien, an alien, alien, an, an alien they know, but an alien nevertheless. Now, the second question was, why didn't uh, the other wolves attack? Look, wolves are um, very careful uh, into starting an uh, open war. And if they would attack, they, they saw a pack from one side, the pack of humans, uh, with one more aggressive human, that was she was. She didn't show exactly dominant behavior, she showed aggressive behavior. And then one of the wolves, uh, uh, you know, kind of took the initiative to um, tell that human that that's not exactly the way we want things to be here. But that was like a one-on-one -on -one, um, fight. Uh, and and it, it was not really dangerous for any parts because if the wolves look at their teammate, uh, their, their teammate was not in danger at any time. I mean, if she would be more exaggerated and would maybe endanger the life of that wolf, then maybe the others would uh, come in and, and react. Welcome. I have something to ask real quick. Um, and I don't know if this is too big of a topic, then we can move on. But um, I do think it's interesting. I, you know, I've been around long enough to see my fair share of dog fights. And uh, for the most part in normal kind of stable, healthy groups of dogs, when a dog fight breaks out, it's quick not too many other dogs, most of the other dogs do not get involved. But I've also been in the types of dog fights where lots of dogs get involved. And so it seems strange, like why does like mobbing, is, is mobbing behavior, why does that happen? And why does it happen? Like it happens a lot in dog parks. If you watch dog fights in dog parks, they tend to attract a large crowd of dogs to get involved. But the worst thing that can happen for a dog is to be singled out as the as, as the, the scapegoat, you know, uh, because then you will have all the others on top. Uh, that's for sure. Mm. I mean, the thing that we say to our kids, uh, don't kick a guy that is already down, uh, that doesn't work in the, in the animal world at all. If one is down, then everybody is going there to make sure that that one stays down, you know, and to assert, um, if, 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 even within a group, the same group, now we're talking about dog parks is not dogs of the same group, the same family, the same pack. Uh, they are not teammates as such. But e even in, in, in a, a well-organized and established uh, group, team, um, if one goes down, all the others go down. If not, if nothing else, just to emphasize and the position that we are above you, you know, which has importance later on, maybe for finding, finding food, uh, who's eating first, second, third, finding shelter, uh, mating partners, you know, you know, and what was interesting is going back to the wolves for a second, they handled it the way we saw in the video, but then you find out after that it's like they made their collective 
decision how to deal with it later because apparently they never let that zookeeper back in the enclosure. No, but, but I've seen that in wolves uh, many times. One of the big differences between wolves and dogs is that wolves do not um, do not uh, uh, forgive like uh, like our our dogs are so easy to work with because they forget, they forgive, they do whatever. You know, every, we can do all mistakes, and they will be nice to us the day after or five minutes later. Or, you know, um, but the the wolves they they don't forget. You know, and if they want someone out or they think that someone should not be there. They are going to to go for it, uh, even if it is one or two or three or four days later. You know, one thing that you cannot show when we are with wolves is you cannot show that you are weak. Okay, you cannot show that you are weak, and people confuse the two things. You know, like oh, I'm nice, so I have to show that I'm weak. No, if you show that you are weak, you have the whole pack on top of you. I've seen that many times. I've been uh, uh, at the wolf park many times with groups working with the uh, uh, Monty Sloan, for instance, and Pat as well. And um, I've seen that many times. If one of the the visitors is feeling a little bit uh, uncomfortable, showing signs of weakness, the wolves begin looking at that person. And that's when uh, good people like Monty and Pat and all the stuff at the, the wolf park will interfere right away and go towards that person, surround that person, so that the wolves don't single her or him out. I'm not talking about showing aggressive behavior. If you show aggressive behavior, probably going to be met with aggressive behavior as well, as we saw in that movie. <clears throat> but you should, if you show weakness, then you're out. Then you, you cannot do anything anymore. Do you think there's any, um, any leftover, you hand a wolf food for free and he thinks you're weak? Do you think there's any of that in our domestic dogs? Yes. Yes? Definitely, yes. If you look at, if you look at uh, this is one of the things that I always follow with all animals, no matter what animal I have to interact with, and people as well. I, I never give anything for free to start with, never. First, we establish a relationship. I show the dog very clearly, I do not want to harm you, but you're not going to harm me. I'm, gonna, uh, I'm not going to intrude in your personal space, but you're not intrude in my personal space either. So I'm not showing any aggressive behavior at all, but I'm not showing any weakness behavior at all. What I do is I wait. And then when we have this relationship, then the dog begins. I, I always wait until the dog asks me for something. Normally they ask for something with some kind of behavior. It could be a muzzle up, um, um, like this, it could be a pocket, whatever. And then we begin to interact. And the first time I give them food is when I ask them to do something specific. It could be, if it is a, a, a difficult dog, I've never seen the dog, the dog has never seen me, I can ask for a sit, for instance, very clearly sit. And when the dog sits, slowly, Dukti. You all know my Dukti, right? Dukti. And that's it. And then I turn around free. I say and turn around and ignore completely. I'm not going to make a big fuss out of that. Like many people say, oh, good dog. It's a wonderful dog. You are so clever. Ooh, so good. You know, this is so exaggerated. I mean, it's only humans that can be like that. I've never seen any animal reacting so emotionally exaggerated uh, any, anywhere in the world. It's very weird for them. What, what I give you is our suggestions, always suggestions. So if you, if one of you says, no, that doesn't work for me, I say, well, okay, that's fine. And if one of you tells me, oh, but I do it completely different, I do it like, 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 like this, like this, like this, and you tell me, and I'm successful, then I say, good for you, continue like that, keep up. Okay. All right, thanks for the question, Anna. It was good, we got to talk about wolves some more. <laughs> All right, so let's, uh, let's, let's move on. Michael, you have some stuff for us? Yeah, sure. Um, and so this morning, Roger told me that um, he really wanted to address one of the videos that was in the group. And so we're going to show that video and talk about it and talk about some of the discussion that's been happening in the group and try to guide the discussion in a uh, in a good direction. Yo, time. OK, so you guys should all be seeing that. And I'm mm -hmm. sure you guys all saw at least some of this video. Okay, so that's the video. Okay, Michael, I cannot see how long is the movie. It's 58 seconds, right? It's a one minute and eight seconds. One minute and eight, okay. All right. 
And uh, I thought we should talk about this movie, uh, especially in our little group here, um, because um, because I've been I, I was reading the comments, and um, I suddenly re realized that um, it shocked it shocked me a little bit. I was a bit shocked by 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 the comments, and uh, I can tell you why. Because first, because we see one minute of eight seconds of the movie. And more or less everybody, if you're not in that, more or less everybody, don't feel singled out by me, okay? Um, almost everybody is assuming, presuming that uh, the dog is dangerous, it's a dangerous procedure, the dog is going to bite the man, and all that. And I, I go and watch the movie again. And um, the text just says in French, uh, he was just adopted. That's what the text says. We don't know anything. What we know is what we see. And what do you see? I see a human and a dog having a, a nice, cozy time together. There is no sign of aggressive behavior from the human point, uh, human side, and there is no sign of any aggressive behavior from the dog side at all. We can show the movie again, and I can show you some um, some of the signs that I'm looking at at the dog, if Michael would be so kind. Yeah, and uh, I just want to say that, uh, like many of the commenters potentially, the video made me uncomfortable. And we talked a lot about it, and we're going to talk about it here too, but yes. the video made me uncomfortable as well, having seen people be bit in the face and misread dog behavior. And so it was a really interesting talking about. Okay, if, if you look... Uh, Il vient d'être adopté means in French he was just adopted. And Michael is going to run the movie. I don't know if it's running. Yeah, here it is. Look, look at the eyes of the dog. It has a quiet gaze. Uh, they are eye, eyes on eyes, very quiet. He kisses the dog. They, look, the, 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 the head goes a little bit up. The, he makes a swallowing movement. Lips are back, ears are back. He keeps his eyes quiet, quiet eye contact. And then you went a little bit towards the man even more. Um, there is no, no sign at all, no aggressive behavior from one or the other. But what I think is important here is, uh, and that's what, what Michael and why we're talking about, because Michael tells me that he feels uncomfortable by it. And I tell him that, um, well, Michael, you, you better explain. Why, why do you feel uncomfortable? Then let's take it from there. Yeah, so part of why I feel uncomfortable is uh, the setup of this video, it's implied that these two individuals are strangers for each other. And um, I think it's risky to become so intimate with a dog that I you don't know. I'll do that with my dogs at home, of course. Um, I'm not afraid of my dogs, but I won't do that to a dog I've just met. And I have seen a lot of videos and in person seen people being bit by dogs that they knew more well than this guy theoretically that from what we, little we know more than this guy knew this dog and that makes me uncomfortable yeah um and there is a slight bias uh, that i you know i have when i see people interact with dogs in such a such an intimate way yeah and i understand you very well i understand you very well because you are human and you are an in intelligent human which means that you read statistics and you uh, try to to calculate to to evaluate your risks and act to reduce your risks, which is again like uh, Anna was mentioning to increase your benefits and decrease your costs. But we have to be extremely careful because we see one minute and eight seconds, and there is nothing wrong whatsoever with that picture. If we admit that <clears throat> there is nothing wrong here. We have nothing to, to say about the dog's behavior that could be dangerous or anything. That's what we have here, one minute and eight seconds. So sometimes I think to suspend judgment is better <clears throat> than to be judgmental, if you understand what I mean. And I think it can be very dangerous. That's why I wanted to talk about this. It can be dangerous instead of suspending judgment and just saying, I don't see anything here uh, dangerous, but I don't have if you ask me how would be in the future, what you can say is I don't have evidence enough to make a prognosis of how it will be in the future. But for what I see, from what I see, there is nothing to point your finger at. 
I think it's dangerous if we go into the guesswork. And I think it's dangerous also, even though I understand very well Michael's uh, feeling uncomfortable. And because I said he's an intelligent person, rich statistics and so on. It's always very dangerous when we are making our judgments based on an individual being member of a certain group. You understand? Because if this was a Bichon Havanese, for instance, then you would just say, oh, it's so cute. Oh, the, the, imagine a Bichon. Oh, it's so cute. Okay? But it's not a Bichon. He's a member of another group. And um, we project to that group. And then we, we judge that dog, which can be the, 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 the sweetest dog in the world. Um, so do you think the judgments weren't coming from the one minute and eight seconds that we had, but from other people's past yes. experiences? Because we actually have a question that sort of leads to that is, um, Luciana says, we see many kids interacting this way and it often leads to bites. And yes. then she also says that the dog freezes in a way and that normally dogs don't stare at each other. No, first, uh, let me see. First, this dog doesn't freeze. This is not freezing. This is not the freezing behavior of a dog. We're going to show other, other clips and I'm going to show what freezing behavior. This is the first. Second thing I would like to emphasize very strong is the, uh, I, I talked to with Michael about that today, is the, the eye contact. People say, no, never have eye contact. Why? Why not? Why not? Eye contact is one of, 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 uh, of the best ways to communicate with whatever animal uh, in the world. Because eyes can communicate many things. Eyes can communicate more than, than words, more than body language, more than dissertation. Because just with, with, with a short eye contact, you can communicate. I'm your friend. I'm friendly. I'm afraid. Uh, I'm insecure. I'm aggressive. I'm furious at you. Everything. The eyes don't lie. I'm always, when I'm working with a dog, always keeping eye contact with them. And I am transmitting what I want through my eyes. And what I want to say is, look, buddy, here we are. We're going to do something together. I'm not going to be bad to you. I don't accept you being bad to me. Let's sort it out, you know. Uh, sometimes if they don't know what it is, what I transmit with my eyes is, oh, I know, I know what it is now. Just follow me. You know, I know what it is, you know. So can I ask you, because it seems like you're proposing to take a neutral stance when approaching this. Don't bring your own assumptions into it when you're looking at a video like this. However, I am biased and I bring bias into it. And let me try to use a metaphor to explain why I come to dogs with a bias. I, I, as some of you know, I'm a hunter. One of the things I hunt is mushrooms, okay? And when you hunt mushrooms, you always assume the mushroom is poisonous until you prove otherwise. Yeah. And I actually approach dogs the same way. I always assume that a dog is, is, a, is dangerous until I have been proved otherwise. I don't start from a neutral stance because that could be dangerous. Um, if the dog's friendly, I didn't put myself in, in danger's way, but if the dog's dangerous, I kept myself out of harm's way. Um, is that, do you think that's a wrong position to hold? I'm not saying treat the dog, you know, badly or anything like that. I'm just saying, I assume that the dog's dangerous until I have reason to believe otherwise. I don't know, because I think much of this depends on uh, the language that we use to describe. And, um, and I'm not sure that uh, I would use the language that probably we, we would do the same, you and me. But I would describe it slightly different. I'm going to give you an, another example, because I do not hunt mush mushrooms, okay? <laughs> but I'm a sailor, as you know. And I love the sea. I have the sea right here, right next to me. You can maybe hear the waves, you know? Uh, I'm a sailor and I love the sea, but do, does that mean that I go to the sea and uh, I'm not worried? No. Does that mean that, uh, that, that I don't worry or, or let me say I don't worry, but I consider what can happen. I respect the sea immensely. Every time I go sailing, I respect the sea. I don't think if you ask me, oh, the sea is potentially dangerous. No, the sea is not potentially dangerous. What is potentially dangerous is if I interact ignorantly and disrespectfully to the sea. And the same I would say to Michael, I would formulate it slightly different even if, even though we, we are out there and you say, oh, those two do exactly the same. I wouldn't say mushrooms are dangerous. Mushrooms are not dangerous. What is dangerous is to have ignorant people 
and disrespect for people around nature, around mushrooms, which can be yeah. poisonous to humans. Yeah. And let me say one more thing that we 100% agree with, uh, but it may be expressed differently in the way we express it. So what he says, if you feel, would feel differently about this video, if it was a golden retriever or a um, Maltese, then uh, I think that you're just, you're, you're wrong about that. You shouldn't feel differently based on that one factor. I think you should be cautious with the Maltese too. I've seen a lot of small dogs bite people. Yeah. Um, and so I think you should treat them all the same and you should, the, the breed uh, information and data about breeds can inform you, but it shouldn't prejudice you necessarily. No. But Michael, uh, let me just, I think I'm sure you agree with the little correction I'm going to make, okay? Or improvement, okay? <laughs> you say you shouldn't feel. You, I don't think we can say that because we cannot tell people how they should feel or not because it's, uh, it's how they do. But what, what we can do is that if we have that feeling, then we can, our reason can correct us. Correct us. Okay, I have this feeling, but do I have reason to do that? You know, and they say, no, I don't have a reason to do that. Actually, I should be c careful with uh, Vichon or a Maltese, as you say, as careful as I am with a Rottweiler or a, a, a pit bull. And I should not beforehand it, consider the pit bull more dangerous than the Bichon. This is what I mean. We then, should, uh, yeah. oh, sorry. We sorry, should move on to the other videos. We have yeah. more videos, right, Michael? Yeah, so yeah. we can compare we a little bit? Yeah. yeah, so I wanted to, because this did make me uncomfortable, I wanted to run a bunch of videos past Roger um, that were similar in my mind. They sh shared similar features. Is it running, Michael? Oh, no, it's it running now. Okay, stop. Can you stop when I say stop? Yeah, you can. Yes. Okay, thank you. Look, here is a very clear signal from me from the dog. The dog walks away to the left. Uh, I know these dogs always have the tail up, but this one is uh, very stiff up. I have also had the huskies, by, by the way, and it's not true that the husky tail cannot be more to the normal or it's always on top. It's not true. They, they move it. You have also a husky, right, Michael? I do. And you can concur that the tail is not always like uh, stiff on top of the, of the back. No, right? my dog keeps his tail down all the time. He yeah. never, unless she's like killing a rabbit, that's the only time her tail goes way up. Right. So here, here is the first sign that I would say, uh oh, this dog is walking away. The man is, uh, and also another thing, the, the position of the, the guy is, is bent over which is an, an extremely uh, controlling and um, uh, dominant behavior. This is more dominant. Look, people don't know what dominant behavior is. That's why they don't use it uh, or correctly or they use it wrong. All behaviors have to be shown in the right quantity at the right time. And to show that you are self-confident is not the same as showing that you are overconfident or dominating as this behavior is. So I would be a little bit careful for the following uh, but but sh please continue, Michael. He looks. Oh, I got a question about that. There, the dog leans into the person touching them. Yeah, uh, what he does is he's hiding. Actually, that's the only place where he can hide. He's uh, looking away. He's hiding his uh, face. And he, he he even presses the back of the dog. So def definitely, he's trying to make the dog do something. The dog is putting up with the behavior until now, but looking away, trying to go away, goes to the next person to see what comes here. And that person just touches and walks away and sits down, which is fine. And she goes directly to, oh, this is not good. She should not have had the eye contact, uh, the, the muzzle. Can you stop, please? Yep. Look, the first thing, the dog comes to her and she goes like this to the dog immediately. She shows an extremely submissive behavior. She, okay, she goes forward and, and she, she's showing kind, when the dog approaches, she's showing actual submissive behavior to the dog. And then she begins uh, uh, handling, petting the dog. So she's being submissive and at the same time intrusive. This is a dangerous situation. This, this, is, this is not good. If I were there, I would interrupt that right away. I would take the dog away and take it her away. It is not the guy in the video with the pit bull also showing a similar behavior of the submissive moving, lowering himself, lowering no, his head no, over he, him. He's showing a self-confident 
friendly behavior. There is a difference between self-confident, friendly and submissive behavior. And this is the thing that I'm trying to show, to, to tell people, be because again, they don't know what submissive behavior, dominant behavior is, they don't know. So they put everything together and this is terribly dangerous. And she shows very insecure body language. Look, she goes forward, submissive behavior, and now she begins handling the... And then another thing, can you stop please? Yep. The guy behind is, uh, is making it worse. I would never support, the guy behind the dog is taking it as a, a kind of support. Oh, we are two. We are two now against a submissive individual. Can you see that? Touching a dog that goes to take contact with anyone, t touching the dog from behind, almost no matter what that is, will be interpreted by the dog as a support. And that's of course you kick the dog, but you're not kicking the dog. So that will be understood as support. Hey, we are two against one. That's more or less how the dog could interpret this behavior. So for me, this is a potentially dangerous situation and very different from the, the French guy that we saw before. And now this is freezing. This is completely different. And now he looks at the man, the man talks to the dog, and he pets the dog on top of that. And there he goes there. Yeah. Not good. Should we go to video number two? Um, but I'm especially happy to meet you after your story yesterday. Hey. What, he's a master. One thing. Stop, please. Go, go, stop. Okay. Right away, I would say this is a dangerous situation. Why? Look. There is someone holding the dog and petting the dog and touching the ears of the dog behind. And there is one person in front that very clear doesn't know what she's doing. She's just trying to be nice in a human way, but not in a doggy way. So again, I would say this situation is very similar to the situation before. We have the dog with someone in, uh, on the back that the dog can interpret like this is my support. And then we have the woman on the right. Uh, doesn't know what she's doing. She's behaving in a, in a very insecure way and she's touching the dog inappropriately. Inappropriate from the point of view that you, you do not touch dogs that you don't know unless they ask you to touch. This is a, a human thing that is, we assume that we can touch all dogs like we want, like with children too. We go to the children, hello, hello, you know, and, and I, I think that's a big mistake. You can, so I, the... I would stop this right away. If I, if I was there, I would stop it. Because this so can the, develop into dangerous. The last video, the husky approaches the lady before she touches. Is that how, why is that not an invitation to touch? We, we don't know. She should give the dog time. Okay. And and as far as I can see, look, it's a bad movie. I'm far away and all that. But yeah. as far as I can see, that is not an invitation. That is, a, I'm going to check you up to see what okay. what are you, you know? And so part of the problem is that in the video with the pit bull that we're contrasting this with is we only see the minute and eight. We don't see how the approach happened. We no. don't see how no. long of time they spent together before this. And we no. don't see what happened after. Correct. Look, now to, to, to link it to Anna's question about wolves and wolves behavior, I can tell you one thing with, with the wolves too. Wolves are testing us all the time. Anyone that has worked with wolves knows that all the time they're testing you, they're watching you, they're testing you. How good is this guy? How, how good can he resolve this situation? They even provoke you sometimes to see how does he react, you know? Mm. And if you react too aggressively, you're done. If you react too fearfully, you're done. If you show some mission, you're done. They're testing you constantly and all the time. They, they want... I'm, I'm going to use a, a, a naughty world, a word in the dog world these days. They want balanced individuals. That's what wolves want. <laughs> Let me ask another question real quick. And it, it kind of ties to this white dog and the husky. Um, are you saying that whenever somebody is behind the dog, they are seeing that person as their backup? Well, n not every time, but in these cases, yes, because that person, on top of that, those persons are actually reinforcing the behavior, not to speak behavioristic mm -hmm. language. They're reinforcing the behavior. They are there. Hey, I'm here. Look, <clears throat> this is very unscientific, but let's try to just to imagine what is the dog thing okay I have a buddy here and oh he's saying to me okay I'm here we are here okay we are good we are good we are a group we are a, a team you know this is very dangerous these situations there's actually that uh, photo of the wolves I think they're it's like before a fight and you have the two wolves and the one wolf and the other brings its head underneath the other one's head 
it's very similar to this actually, where yeah. they're, they get in contact with each other as like, we're both here supporting each other. Yes. It's, I, I didn't back. connect that until right now. Okay. You can play it, but uh, I, I, I think I don't, I don't think I want to see more. You, you don't want to see more? No, because I, I think I know what's going to happen. So we should warn everybody then, if you don't want to see more, <laughs> look yeah, away. You're going to see some dogs biting people. So look, just in this FYI. situation, let me tell you right away, it would not surprise me if the dog bites her. Gorgeous. Oh, I'm so glad you're okay. You too. You too. Thank goodness for you. Um, gosh. Have a great and now the dog wants to go away and she doesn't respect that. There we go. Go away. Okay. 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 Anything more to say about that video before we do number three? No, except that it was taken in winter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, number three. Stop. Okay, first thing. So typical human behavior and so wrong. And you know what? I... I Okay, I'm going to control myself and say it very quietly. And I tell you why I'm going to control myself because I've been telling this since the beginning of the 80s. Do not make this thing to a dog, this petting. You know, since the 80s, I've written books, I've shown it in movies, I've been on the TV telling that to people. And we see, still see that in 2000, what is it, 20, right? 20. Yeah. We still see that. It's amazing. This is the first wrong thing. There is another thing that I also noticed, which which I would say it's wrong. Uh, I, I, I assume the dog belongs to the officer, right? And that the other one is a, is a, a stranger. Um, you cannot uh, approach a, a, a dog with the officer right to it, holding it on the leash like this, because this is again the same principle we saw before. The dog is there to, to in, in the group. It's a group. This is a pack the dog and the officer, and then there is a stranger, okay? Mm. And this is, for me, already a potential danger situation. Okay, stop. Ah, yeah. You see, I said stop before he attacked. Um, you want me to go back a little there? No, you, you could see it. You could see it right away. I don't know how many seconds you can see, but uh, it's, um, uh, it's, it's very, very easy to see what's going to happen. If you go f further back, you, I can uh, look there. There you have it. There, six seconds. I don't need more than that. You, th so, that is that is a stiff. Look at the eyes, guys. Look at the eyes. Look at the, uh, the way that dog looks at the man. That has nothing to do with the gaze that we saw in the first movie with the the French guy with the the pit bull. Was it a pit bull, by the way, Michael? It was. Yeah. Okay. It has nothing to do with that. This is it, a completely it, different. Uh, and here's the thing for me is there's a, there's enough uh, similarities. You've got ears back, you've got touching, you've got this eye contact from both parties. There's enough of these similarities that I can understand. Like that's why my hackles go up when I see the pit bull video yeah. is because there's enough similarities that in the moment you go, oh my gosh. And then you, it, it's hard to stop yourself and say, wait a second, is this really dangerous or am I just being paranoid? But I understand you perfectly well, Michael. I understand you. The shape of the eyes. Yeah. The, it's very different. Yeah. Yeah. My point was exactly that, that the gaze in itself, uh, you don't say the dog is looking at me. It depends how is it looking at you. But of course, these are details. And most people do not, do, uh, do not know those details. So of course, I understand Michael being worried about it. I would be worried too uh, with people that don't know anything about dogs just interacting with dogs like that, you know. The problem with dogs, let me tell you, is that we all think that we know everything about dogs because it's a, it's a domestic, it's our best friend and so on. But do you think anyone would approach, do you think any of these guys that we see here in the movie would approach a lion or a tiger the same way? No way. Does anybody have any questions? If you do, go ahead. You can write them in the chat or you can raise your hand. Anna. Hi. Um, it's not really a question. Um, if you see the dog's uh, body language, you can see that the last three of them were um, looking directly at the person. And the pit bull was standing a little aside, maybe uh, had given a hip nudge, I, yes. I yes. think, to the, to the human. 
Correct. Um, the the last two were were um, tied up. Were the human were um, oh my god I'm not uh, it, it, uh, the, uh, them both uh, couldn't f um, fly so yeah. couldn't get off the, that that interaction that right. was going on. Sorry about my English. I don't speak a lot. Uh, so often it's a little bit rusty. So if you don't understand anything that I'm saying, please. That's please, good. That's uh, good. We got. <laughs> and the first one. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, the first one, the ski. I, 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 I think that he was curious. The ski. I, I think that it was uh, curious about the woman. And like Professor said, the, the woman um, give a submissive posture and. That is why he didn't back up. I think that's my opinion. Uh, the the last one, the the last two were were tied up, so uh, they couldn't run away or they couldn't get away from from that intrusion. Uh, that's my opinion. I don't know if yes, if you want to. Yeah, I want to anything. comment. Yeah, yes, and I want to comment on that because you 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 mentioned some important things. Because there are two things, we don't know, we're just looking at a, a, a clip, we don't have any background information or anything, because mm -hmm. we're talking about the husky. The husky, there are two options. One of them is that the husky actually react to her as, as the husky would react to another another husky, another dog, in which case it mm -hmm. would be just a rawr, go down, and then the other would go down, make get up again, and nothing. There was nothing, there was no tooth marks, there was nothing. But the, pro the problem is that the human face is not as tough as dog skin. So, of course, when they do that mm -hmm. to us, uh, that hurts and that has consequences. If that is the case, yeah. then we can we begin to trying to it's kind of forensic um, <laughs> analysis of the problem. We can go back and try to see. So maybe this dog had been uh, badly socialized. Maybe socialization was bad. Maybe nobody... Maybe he didn't have any mother, a good mother like we saw in the first movie of an ethologist reacts, a good mother that goes to them and makes and the dog goes. Maybe he didn't have one that did that without injuring them. Because then it would the dog would learn, oh, mm -hmm. you can show things but inhibit your movement so that you don't use your teeth. So maybe it had, he didn't have siblings because they learn the bite inhibition with siblings. Because if they bite too much, then the sibling turns around and bites them. So they learn very quickly that. Maybe there is okay. a problem. This behavior has been reinforced earlier. And I suspect that to be true. You know why? Because you see a situation like that. And what is the human reaction? Nobody cared about the dog. Nobody told the dog that it was wrong what the dog did. On the contrary, they all ignored the dog, you know, and uh, get panic and try to uh, help the woman. But nobody. So the, the dog. dog says, finally, some peace and quiet. Yes. <laughs> yes. Dog's behavior is extremely reinforced by these. So the dog learned one lesson here. When I want them to go away, I just go home. And then they go away. Yeah. And, and okay. um, that is a thing that Michael can discuss in one of his shows, controversial questions in dog training. For instance, this is one of them. We are reinforcing the behavior that we do not want. Let me come with a provoking question. <laughs> oh, no, I'm going to come with a provoking statement and let you think about it. Okay? Reinforcers are dangerous. <laughs> think about that. Any questions? <laughs> okay. okay. So, you know, Michael has this. I, we can say it's a little bit of maybe not so pleasant experience that makes him more careful, maybe not personal, but maybe just watching. I do and too. It can so be I the other way it. around. And mm. Yeah. So I and I just see a lot of of the similar breed just the day before with Trish, and all were really good. <laughs> so when I watched that video, oh, you know, that's really a loving. Uh, Yes, but I think emotion can be adaptive and maladaptive for human too. And I think that um, what differentiates us is that we can take time to reappraise our emotion before we take action. Christina, 
uh, I wrote a chapter in one of my books, which I call it, uh, I, as you know, as I'm an evolutionary biologist, so I'm very interested in evolution of traits. And I call it the runaway evolution of emotions, uh, where, yes. where my conclusion is that they were adaptive at one time. Uh, they gave us benefits, and that's why we developed. But I, I would call the, the, the I would say, I, I'd say in that book too, that it's uh, like a, um, a blind, blind, blind alley or what the French call a cul-de-sac, which is a road with no end, you know, emotions. And they, they will come to a point where they will begin working against us, uh, humans, and then natural selection will uh, take care of that. Um, and then we will become less emotional. Yeah. There are the it's in the ethology book, if you guys want to. Oh, what it? Okay. It's, yeah, it's in the ethology book. It's in the course. Yeah. Okay. I mean, maybe it's in both places, but I know for a fact it's in the ethology book, in the ethology course. Once when I have the time, I'm going to make a, a new edition because I have... I'm, I'm a little less ignorant today than I was five years ago when I wrote it. <laughs> well, yeah, and it's such an interesting theory, and I'm, I really want you to expand more on that. But it seems obvious, like, a lot of times when you have this runaway evolutionary process, it's very tied to sexual selection. You see yeah. the same thing with deer who develop antlers so big they can't navigate a forest. Yeah. And they die of starvation, being in, you know, either interlocked with another deer or trapped in trees. Yeah. Um, and so, but that's sexual selection at its worst or best. Who knows? Yeah, but no, you're right. Uh, I mean, I, I also write uh, several places uh, that uh, there are only two things that matter in life: is food and sex. Uh, so, of course, uh, the first selection is to survive. Food and second one is to reproduce, to pass your genes to the next generation. And this is not conscious. It's not like, oh, now I want to, now I want to, now I want to. It's um, just if you don't do it, your genes uh, are, are gone, your history, you know, so it's... Insects got it right where they combine the food with the sex and they just eat their mate after they're done with them. You're right. <laughs> I think we have a question from uh, Luciano. Michael, we're not yeah. allowed to speak about food and sex. Yeah. <laughs> <Hi>. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have, we have a question <laughs> from Luciano. Thank you very much. Uh, you can see me, right? Yes, I, we can I, see you. I, I just want to make sure. Uh, hi, uh, hello from Monterrey, Mexico. Uh, I just want to make sure I understand it uh, very clearly. So, in the husky, the case of the husky, like he attacked the girl because first he saw a submissive behavior, and then she changed to a dominant behavior, and the no. husky is also being no. It was no. not a. It, it was not dominant behavior. No, she she showed submissive behavior. Definitely submissive behavior. And he had support uh, behind to the left. From the other uh, man. So he, he, he just um, uh, treated her like he would treat any other dog that he meets on the streets, on the park, in the park, you know. He goes walking, there is another dog that comes, shows some easy behavior, then he goes there, goes, Arr! and then if that dog shows uh, pacifying behavior, then it's fine, then they are good friends and all that. But the problem is, as I said, that that dog will not be injured because they have, uh, you know, tough uh, skin and fur and all that but uh, but and she did you know okay so. and what is the what is the objective the main objective of that of that behavior from the husky from the dog yeah if he were yeah. to do that to another dog on the street uh that was showing submissive behavior what would the purpose of that behavior be yeah uh, thank you look the purpose is always to to get as many benefits as a little cost as possible and if you show the other dog that, A, I can control this situation, then let's say that five minutes later they find some food. That dog doesn't need to fight with the other about food. The only thing he needs to do is look at the other, put the ears up, maybe, maybe make a little slight VA. Can you see what I'm doing? Just <laughs> without sound. And that will be enough. And the other one goes away. The other one will make, <coughs> which in dog language means pacifying behavior. And then he goes and eats the food. No fight, no uh, uh, energy cost, no blood, nothing. Or it could also be that they m meet the, the two are males and they meet a female in heat. Okay? That is also a competition. Right. There's also a resource. And instead of fighting, like the Michael said, the, the, the you know, deer with the handlers and all that, and maybe they injure one and one another and one of it's not unusual that one of them dies breaks the neck you know these two they don't because the more submissive one 
looks at them and says, okay, 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 and goes away. And going away is always the best strategy, a better strategy because there are many females, you know. There will come another one. Maybe next year there will be another one. And maybe this guy won't be there. Maybe he will be dead. Or maybe he's senile. Or maybe he became impotent. Meanwhile, we don't know. There are many, many alternatives. But the morale of the story is wait and fight another day. Because if you wait, maybe you have a chance. And then you pass wise genes to the next generation. I think there have been some studies that show that. Thank you very much. You are welcome, Luciano. Good questions. Thank you. Gracias, gracias, Luciano. I think there have been some studies that show that actually uh, the submissive strategy can be a very effective one actually for passing on your genes and that sub submissive males that stay within a pack yeah. can sometimes get opportunities at breeding behind the back of the dominant individual fairly yeah. regularly. Be better opportunities than he could be just going off on his own. But there is a term in ethology that we use, uh, which call, it's called stealing a copulation. Uh, don't get <laughs> guys, this is the one we use. We elaborate a bit on that. Depends also on the, um, on the uh, mating strategy, because if you see sea lions, for instance, for sea lions, there is only one thing for two males, is go for it and fight. Fight, and if you fight, you die. And if you die, you die. There is nothing to do about it. And why? Look at it from an evolutionary point of view. A male sea lion, only has one chance to mate and if it is if he really brings down the the owner of the harem because sea lions have a harem of many females so if he doesn't he will never mate so his genes disappear so for him genetically if we speak about darwin fitness uh, there is only one strategy it's go for it and and um, fight if, if you die you die that's it all right. Well, on that note, <laughs> we're at, <laughs> we're we at like time. We like to end on a positive note. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that this will go there. <laughs> Thank so, you. So, Jessica, do you want to yes. say something before I say goodbye? Yes. Yes. You guys, um, most of you are regulars, but hello to all the, you know, you people who are joining us and some of our, our newer people. Um, we've changed our programs a little bit. You, sh you should know this, but you can find the, uh, the, the new schedule on the Ethology Institute. You can find it on the website. You can find it in the uh, Facebook groups. Basically, what we're going to be doing for the rest of the year is having programs on Tuesdays and Thursdays, Tuesdays and Thursdays, with uh, every other week. So next week, we're not going to have anything, but the following week is going to be the very first, you're not going to want to miss this, the very first controversial questions in dog training with Michael McManus and, of course, Professor Brantes. So that's going to be uh, next Tuesday, the 15th, and we'll follow that up on Thursday the 17th with a meet your tutors meeting and then take a week off. The next week we will have our second an ethologist reacts which, with of course Professor Abrantes and guests and we'll follow that up on Thursday with another meeting like this so you can ask any questions that maybe we didn't get to in the ethology reacts program. So a lot going on and that's going to be our schedule um, for the rest, rest of the year. So we'll see you guys definitely on Tuesday for Michael McManus and uh, controversial questions in dog training. So that'll be September the 15th, the next meeting. Thank you very much for uh, being here today. And uh, I hope to see you next time again. So be safe and uh, have fun, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Mm -hmm.